Hello, come on in. Hi. Um, come over a seat. Hmm, good to see you. Well, we've come on a bit of a red letter day because uh, my new book has arrived. It doesn't matter how many books you've written, there's still a particular thrill when something which began life as a series of glimmerings in your mind with no substance in the world is finally born as a physical book. And this one is called Heaven in Ordinary and it's uh, the second little collection of my essays, my short reflective pieces that I write in the tradition of the English familiar essay that I've talked to you about before, um, sort of following the likes of Hazlitt and uh, and before him, Samuel Johnson and others writing these short little pieces. And um, I'm particularly pleased, I love the physicality of books, but I really like the cover of this one. As you can see, it's a very atmospheric, beautiful picture of a, a garden. You're looking through the trees, you can just see dimly the buildings beyond. But this is no ordinary garden. This, it's painted by Roger Wagner, whom you may remember, I showed you a beautiful painting of his up on my wall there. So this painting by Roger Wagner, is actually of the garden in the rectory at Bemerton in, in near Salisbury. And that is where George Herbert lived and where he was a priest. So the great priest poet, 17th century priest poet George Herbert, that's his garden. I've stood there and looked at that. So to have it on the cover of my book is wonderful. And of course, the reason why we chose that is that the title of the whole book, Heaven in Ordinary, is one of the great phrases of George Herbert's. And uh, it's in his poem, Prayer. But Herbert's poetry is full of these moments when, when suddenly the ordinary becomes extraordinary, where the earthly becomes heavenly. I mean, he puts it in another poem of his, he says, a man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth, through it pass and then the heavens a spy. And um, all the essays in this book, one way or another, are about some little moments of transformation or transfiguration. So I'm gonna read you one of them about something that um, actually Herb Herbert could never have known because it wasn't invented in his day. But it's a true story and um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm puffing away at this lovely um, Peterson spigot um, and there's a certain amount of um, puffing that goes on in this story as well so maybe it's appropriate. Um, I'll read it to you just for fun. It's called An Unexpected Arrival. I was in the railway station in York among a group of disconsolate and displaced passengers dis decanted out of various delayed and diverted trains and left to stew on platform three, waiting for replacement services, when something superb and unexpected happened. I was trying to get back to Cambridge from St Andrews, where I had enjoyed an intense and wonderful few days, taking part in close readings of four quartets, Indeed, some lines from The Dry Cell of Ages had been going through my head, lines to the effect that we, we are never the same people at the end of a journey as we were when we left the station, or who will arrive at any terminus. When our train stopped suddenly, just north of Berwick-on-Tweed, and we were told that there was a broken-down trade ahead of us, T.S. Eliot was right. We were going nowhere. Eventually, in about the time it takes to read and digest Eliot's complete poems, we limped into York and I joined that group of other frustrated passengers looking for a fresh connection. And then that is when it happened. We were all looking at our watches, straining at changing departure boards and listening to the scarcely audible garble of announcements when a train did appear in the distance but it was not the one that any of us expected. With great clouds of white steam, with a glorious whistle sounding above the steady chuff, chuff and rhythm of its wheels, resplendent in its green and black livery, its brass plates polished and shining, 
the flying Scotsman, came proudly down the line, pulling a couple of old Pullman carriages, and stopped just beyond us with a satisfying hiss of steam. If the appearance of the train was unexpected and wonderful, the effect it had on the people on that platform was even more so. Suddenly, the very same people who'd been checking their watches, shouting or scolding into their phones, sighing and frowning and complaining into the air, were all now smiling, standing, exclaiming to one another on how lovely it was, pressing pause on complaint forms or angry emails so as to take photos instead. I have occasionally happened on platforms scheduled for the arrival of famous steam trains. And then, of course, everybody knows what's coming. The place is crowded with enthusiasts taking photographs and checking numbers. But on this occasion, the Scotsman had, I imagine, been just as delayed as we were. And no one was expecting its arrival. There was no reception committee. So it all felt unforced, natural, a sheer bonus. And that's why it had the effect it did. All of us, myself included, were lifted unexpectedly out of our petty little cycles of self-pitying complaint and forgot ourselves altogether for a moment as this shining emblem of a bygone age arrived. Was it just nostalgia? Partly, perhaps. But I don't think everyone on that platform was necessarily a signed-up steam enthusiast. I think it's partly because the engines of that era were, and are, objectively, things of beauty. But mostly because anything that has been loved and cared for, restored from ruin and treasured again, carries with it a kind of aura, a kind of benediction. I think that goes for people as well as steam engines. Anyway, so that's um, a happy memory of, uh, of uh, frustration turned into elation, which is quite often the pattern of my life. Um, I'm not a paid-up steam enthusiast, but I must say I do love to see an old steam engine. And I'm just old enough and lived in far enough away parts to remember them myself when I was a child in Africa. Most of the railway engines, especially the one that we took down from Harare, Salisbury it was then, down to Port Elizabeth. Uh, they were all steam engines. And I loved them. I was a bit in awe of them because it was amazing when they suddenly released steam. It was a huge sound of the steam coming out from under the wheels. But I loved the sound they made. And maybe my love of rhythm in poetry has got something to do with long African train journeys on chuffing steam trains. I don't know whether that's also got to do with the fact that I love to do a bit of chuff chuffing and puff puffing myself. But uh, there it is. Anyway. Um, Yes, it's out in the world now and I'm thrilled to have it and uh, glad to have you here in the library to share an author's joy in a newborn. Thanks for coming round.